how does a film like this get made? Uh, by the generosity of a, a lot of people who believe in the film. Um, you know, we got a bunch of individuals who like read the script, believed in Darren, and uh, we put it together with their help. So, so we thank them. Indeed. So can you tell us how the project came to be? Because it's an unusual kind of development. Uh, well, the screenplay was entered into the Outfest Writers Lab. They match the five finalists, uh, screenplay finalists with directors. And I was paired with GBF uh, by Guinevere Turner, who's a writer. She wrote American Psycho and is an old friend of mine. And she thought I would like it. I read it. I loved it. I called the writer in New York, who is a 28-year-old working in advertising. I said, George, I want to option this to direct. And he's like, oh, OK, cool. <laughs> and that was that. The rest is hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> Always, totally. How, you know me so well. Uh, <laughs> um, but I really believed that, because I met you, and I believed you had written the film because I could hear your voice. I mean, it's you. The, the film is you, somehow. Well, you know, films are so difficult to put together that when they do happen, it's sort of a universe, an experience, a spiritual experience for me, because the film sort of like willed into, into being, or not willed, but by a higher power. And so when I read GBF, I was like, oh my god, I could have written this. It's so smart and funny, and it's a teen classic on the page. I was laughing out loud. And I was like, oh, but there's a sl a slow motion walk in it. I've done that. Really, again? But yes, again, because now <laughs> the, the gay boy is part of the, the clique of girls. And that's sort of a fantasy that so many Jawbreaker fans have, and, and gay boys in general, is to sort of be you know, fabulous and wearing like eight inch Louis Vuittons and all that stuff. <laughs> so Michael, um, were a lot of your fantasies realized in making this film? Absolutely. <laughs> no, I don't know. The slow motion walk was kind of daunting. There's a lot to live up to. And we only had so many takes being an indie film. We filmed this over 18 days or something. Oh um, there was a lot of things that I loved about the script, if that's what you mean. And a little bit of improvisation along the way. Yeah, we, we got to all add s sort of uh, lingo that we would use. Um, I got later, later in there because that's something we used to say back home. Um, but my character, no, I, I played the straight man, ultimately, in terms of comedy, and um, everyone else sort of got to improv around me. I, I kind of stuck to the script for the most part. But are you part of this <coughs> kind of region, this, this, this kind of the way of talking, the way of being? Because for us, we don't live over oh. there. It's all very foreign <laughs> to us. But are you from this culture? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, this all makes very much sense to me. <laughs> yeah, um, this is how a lot of people talk, like in high school and the Valley, especially. I was raised in the Valley, in Sino, California, by the Sherman Oaks Galleria. Yeah. That's where they shot Valley Girl and other teen classics. <laughs> oh, Fast Times at Richmond High was, uh, was actually shot there. And Michael's from Fresno, which is in California as well, so he's naturally a valley Holler. girl. Holler. If you live in California <laughs> and you're gay, you're a f***ing valley girl, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Always. How fascinating. <laughs> <coughs> well, no, it's... It is. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting from a British point of view to see this culture in its richness. Well, well the, the, the problem I've had since the film is I've had problems stopping because it's like totes, like, contagious, and like you just speak like this, and it's totes cray cray. It's totes contage. <laughs> <laughs> OMG. Yeah, so no, I, grew, I grew up with like the John Hughes movies, the soundtracks for like Some Kind of Wonderful and Clueless and like Sixteen Candles, Pretty in Pink. So like, I feel like for a great teen film, you want to re revisit it and uh, listening to it at the gym, hello fags, and in your car are all really major things, you know? 
Well, the, the interesting thing was, I mean, you know, some of these are very high-profile bands and, and, and are not generally interested in like putting their music in a, into an independent film. And our music supervisor, Daniel Arriaga, knew Tegan and Sarah like, uh, personally. And he sort of reached out to them, and they agreed to give us that song for a, a ridiculous discount on what their usual quote is. And that just broke the logjam with so many of the other uh, artists who were willing to put their films in the mu in to put their music in the film if Tegan and Sarah were going to as well. And the soundtrack budget was like a quarter of the budget of the film, which, is, which just goes to show how important music is for a teen movie. Th there's certain monikers that trigger what a teen film is meant to be. So if you're making one independently, you still have to spend the money on music. The movie uh, skewers everybody from, you know, um, African Americans to he homosexuals to Mormons to Christians to fatties. So it's really about how we're all in the closet in high school about something. So it's sort of using the gay experience to trigger a more universal ex uh, experience. Yeah. No one was off limits. Because if this, if this, if this, if the screenplay never read is a strictly gay movie, to me that's preaching to the converted. What's interesting about the movie is, is, is if it can reach a wider audience. And, you know, like I don't know if, if any of you have heard, but in America it's gotten an R rating, which is restricted. And in the UK it's gotten a what? 15. 15, which is what is that about? <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like, I think it's just it's showing that the establishment doesn't want you to see sort of gay imagery, relationships, language, slang presented in a mainstream context, which is what this movie is. One of the things I really responded to in the script, though, about Mormons, like, we, I think we have a certain cause to be a little angry with the Mormons in California after the whole Prop 8 debacle. debacle. How, I forget how to pronounce things across the <laughs> pond. Um, but, uh, but what I loved about it is it didn't deal with the Mormons with anger. It just said they were stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and kinky and oversexed. Yes, yeah. they are. <laughs> Taylor is very close to his character in the movie. Let me just tell all of you that. <laughs> well, we're sort of hoping that with this film that this is the last of those sort of niche cliche, you know, those stereotypes and the labeling. I think it's probably more common in America, all of this compartmentalizing of people and, and what, to ca what you're called and who you are and... Um, so ho I don't really know if there's a solution except s more exposure to these kinds of characters. Uh, hopefully this, there will no longer be gay and straight characters. It will just be about people. Michael's actually uh, starring in a new MTV series called Faking It, where he plays a character very similar to Tanner, but five years after GBF. So Tanner now like rules the school. He's the most popular ki gay kid. It's not actually Tanner, but it's the same idea. Yeah. It's like... Uh, it's the same tone. Actually, George Northey, the writer of this film, is on the writing staff for faking it. So it, it's a very similar idea. So wouldn't you have to be aged to... to <laughs> <laughs> no, I will not. I don't think so. That's so, uh, that is like killing my babies. Um, I would have to say, uh, Heather's is my favorite. <laughs> yes. Daniel Wat and Daniel Waters, who wrote Heather's, uh, loves GBF and wrote on my Facebook page, welcome to the teen, the iconic teen mo movie canon, which was really sweet. Yeah. Because he didn't like Jawbreaker. <laughs> 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 which is totally understandable, because I don't like Mean Girls. <laughs> Must you ask that? <coughs> I adore my lesbians, but honey, <laughs> they're not funny. Uh, <laughs> for, for, uh, I, I've been a, a assistant programmer at Outfest in years past, and I remember, I won't say the name of the film, but I watched this film, and I went to the programming director. First of all, I said, I found this film. It's a little ropey in places. It's hard. It's tough. But... It's a light lesbian comedy. Uh, and 
it's Actually, can I just uh, say a, 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 a <laughs> naked plug, a naked plug for Guinevere Turner, who's coming to the festival okay. in a film that is a fabulous lesbian comedy that gives the lie to that terrible yeah, thing yeah, you just yeah. said. No, that I, yeah. um, <laughs> there are funny lesbians, and um, the, word the vagina wolf. Yeah. The vagina wolf. And speaking of plugs, my show Faking It has two lesbians in it Ooh. as the lead. But is it funny? So you guys, I like it's quite funny. Oh, it is quite funny. You guys, listen to this. Some lesbians can be totally funny. That was all a moment in time. Let's <laughs> rewind that. <laughs> but generally, they're not. 